Hello, everybody. This is Kirk Spano with Investing 2020s, doing an interview for Seeking Alpha and for my own services. We are here to get today with the um, CEO of Spire Global, a company that I did an article on about two years ago and uh, took a little nibble in then. Since then, I've backed up the truck. We're going to talk to Peter Platzer and find out why I did that and hopefully find out that I'm right. Peter, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, Kirk. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I love your background. So <laughs> please apologize if I call you Captain Kirk inadvertently at, at some point or the other. I'm very happy to be here and talk with you. Well, that's a, that's way better than some of the names I get once in a while. Um, so let, let's talk about space. And yep. satellites are what, 50,000 kilometers up in the air? So let's get the 50,000 kilometer view what is Spire Global? What are you trying to do? And, uh, you know, what does the next year or two look like to you? At a very high level, um, Spire is a company that leverages space to improve life on Earth. We use satellites to collect uh, critical data, unique and proprietary data that helps humanity with some of our greatest challenges, be that logistics, be that food supply, be that global security, be that climate change, be that weather those are the services that we provide um, as a subscription to our customers. We have been able to grow in, uh, uh, in five years from 1 million to our first 100 million, and we continue to grow very, very rapidly. Um, uh, those of us that follow us know we have over 800 customers in, uh, uh, in Q2, the earnings that we just did. You know, we talked about our year-over-year -year growth of revenue and 37% uh, year-over-year. Um, uh, and, and a very, very short-term path to, uh, to profitability. And when I say profitability, you know, we're talking cash flow and not just EBITDA. Right, right. Yeah, I um, wrote an article about Spire Global in October of 2021. And at that time, you know that we were in the whole SPAC boom. And I was picking through a lot of those. I got to know how to invest in them pretty well understood how warrants worked and uh, basically they were set up a lot like partnerships where the people bringing it to market would get a, a cut for doing that. And a lot of them didn't work out well. Some of them were bad ideas. And as you know, and I know, uh, the share price has plummeted uh, with virtually all of them. There's almost no SPACs that are up. Um, you know, we're in a few that are, and then a few that aren't. And I think as an investor with going on three years of experience and managing hundreds of millions of dollars at some points, that what we have seen with the SPAC companies, the D SPACs, is kind of the Gartner hype cycle, right? So many of those companies weren't worth the $10 a share they were, they were offered for at the time. In the future, a lot of them will be. So we're at a point now where the hype cycle has happened. We're down at kind of that trough of despair, they, they call it. And it seems to me, and I've been pretty good at picking these out, uh, it seems to me that we're on the path of adoption. You're starting to see big growth with you guys. Um, but I think that investors are still terrified. And, and that reflects itself in, one, you've got indexers that not buy nothing but, but large caps. Um, but two, there's just this the whole notion of SPACs being virtually evil. So I just want to hear from you. What is your experience with that whole process, the highs, the lows, the in-betweens, what you learned, and, and kind of what's coming next in your opinion? Yeah. So I think if, if, if I had perfect hindsight um, uh, three years ago at the end of 2020, um, I would have uh, stayed on the direct to IPO path that I was on, and I would have foreseen a global pandemic and uh, unknown that there's going to be a war coming with uh, a dramatic exorbitant raising of interest rates that right. is going to bring down uh, every single growth stock and especially SaaS companies. Um, unfortunately, um, or, or probably fortunately for, for the people around me, I'm not endowed with perfect um, uh, foresight or hindsight in this case. And so I didn't. Now, we were, um, uh, you know, we have like this 10-year arch that I, that I talked about, this longer-term arch. You know, this started with, our first 1 million of revenue, um, then we had a minimum viable consolation in 2017. And the next phase of my long-term plan was, okay, now we're going to do triple, triple, double, double, double. 
We got to grow to 100 million in five years. I know very, very few companies have done it, but you know, man, are we going to go for it? And I think we delivered that. You know, we grew to 100 million in five years' time. Right. But in that journey, we recognized, okay, we're selling to governments, we're selling to large corporations, we're selling to international corporations, and they are looking for stamp of approvals. You know, in the decision makers in those type of organizations, they follow the you never get fired for buying IBM principle which means it's very hard for a private company, you know, a startup from San Francisco to land a hundred million dollar contract with, you know, a, a government. And so we said, okay, we have to be a public company. And so we started going down the public route. Um, at that point in time, you know, I, you know, I've worked in the markets for 10 years, similar to you as an investment manager. Um, uh, the path that I knew was you go directly to the market and do your IPO and you deal with, you know, all the, you know, the, 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 the green shoe and everything else that comes with it, all the good and the bad. But that was the path that we were on. And then there were um, a lot of people talking to us about, well, the problem with that um, way to market is um, it's, a, it's less certainty of capital raise um, was what they're telling us. And you don't get any experience into the company. Now, there is a, a pathway called SPAC that at that point in time was getting a lot of traction and being the typical, you know, skeptical Wall Street guy that had heard, heard of, of CDO squares and stuff, they're like, eh, I don't know. But there was an, you know, um, uh, increasing support from extremely experienced people I had around the table. I mean, I'm talking here, Bessemer Venture Partners and the like, that say, you know, SPACs are very real and, and you should absolutely consider that. And so when uh, a pair of very experienced operators um, approached us and said, you know, we, we want to do us back with you, um, I, you know, I, I very, very carefully listened to that. And it was sensible that someone that had built companies and sold them and had served the U.S. government and someone who has been, you know, taking companies public five times in a row could be a tremendous asset for the company and not just bring capital into the company. And that's why we decided um, and go down that fateful and in hindsight, probably not, you know, the best decision um, spec route at that point in time, because by the time we actually went public, you know, the market had completely turned, redemptions were very, very large, and no one liked the stock. The reason being that the vast majority of companies taking that route were going public with no revenue whatsoever. And so SPAC became identical in many investors' world with companies that are great PowerPoints with no revenue and like a long, 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 long time before they ever going to produce any money. And Spire was in the unfortunate position. And they had literally had investment bankers that tell me that. said, Peter, your biggest problem is like you have too much revenue. Like you actually have metrics that people can look at. And that's bad because everyone else has no metrics and they can just put whatever they want. You know, in Austria, we say paper is patient and right. people put a lot of stuff on that paper. And so that that was kind of like the situation we found ourselves. You know, we went forward and then, you know, we continued to be thrown into like the bulk. And we were one out of 100 companies that had no revenue. And we were one which had revenue and the near term path. And then, you know, a global pandemic happened right thereafter and interest rates because of the war, which further depressed the situation for high growth companies, for subscription companies. Um, uh, in some cases, you know, there were very, very big name companies last year that dropped more last year than Spire did because of the interest rate environment. So you had two compounding things that unfortunately I didn't foresee um, that put us now in a position where Spire has, I think, executed very, very strongly. And, uh, and it's creating very, very good opportunities for investors that look at the metrics um, uh, of the company and not necessarily um, uh, other parts uh, of uh, other companies that have done similar, you know, let's say IPO path inspire, but have very, very different metrics. Right. You, you know, you covered a lot of ground there and I appreciate that. Uh, I have seen in my career a number of times where good companies, you know, companies get thrown out with the bathwater. So in this case, I can look across 180 SPACs or whatever it ended up being and, and look and see, you know, 10 or 20% of them are going to be around in five years, even though they've gotten crushed. And that's something that I say to my uh, folks all the time, all my subscribers and followers and clients is when a, when a company's stock price gets beat up, 
and it gets so low that none of the numbers make sense anymore. And and I'll just say applying normal ratios and valuations to Aspire Global, it, it should be several dollars higher right now. Really, no questions asked. But there is a bias out there that is going on, and that's just the way that it is. I look at it as a weird opportunity. So back in June, um, like I told you off air, uh, my clients are way into the upper six figures of shares owned now. Like I said, I, first, I bought my first handful of shares at like seven bucks. And then I bought it again at like three bucks. But I really kind of backed up the truck in June. And that happened to be when you guys used your ATM facility a little bit. So um, you're welcome because I think some of that money was ours. But, uh, you know, I, I want to ask you about the ATM. Um, but I think it's important that people understand that the market is emotional and that from time to time, those emotions beat things up that shouldn't be beat up quite as much. And, and again, the question that I always ask people is if it's beat up that much, there's only really one question to ask and is, will it be around in five years? And given the contracts that you have and the fact that your satellite set up, and we're going to talk about this later because some of your satellites are ridiculous, um, and the low cost of production, and, and the fact that you've got, what, the second or third largest constellation. Uh, yep. with, you know, and, 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 and here's something that people should understand is that the five years it took you to grow to $100 million in revenues, uh, that's one of the fastest um, in history uh, yep. for a company like yours. So, you know, I don't have that chart laying around so I can rattle off the names, but it's pretty impressive. So let, let's go to the ATM. In, in in June, you utilized your ATM. The only time, I believe, is what you said on the conference call the other day. And, yep. you know, the stock wasn't heavily shorted at that time. There was a weird failure to deliver in the share, share short. Uh, and I think the ATM issuance, you know, the fact that it was met pretty well uh, with buyers. I mean, the stock was only down uh, from where it was in round trips back to after the shares were issued. Um, about six million shares, if I if I recall. And the stock price did not maintain a sell off. You know, it came back pretty quick. And we bought into that trough and that move. Um, so as far as the ATM goes, obviously now as a pretty big shareholder, you know what my question is. Are you going to be really reluctant to use the ATM anymore? Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely, absolutely <laughs> correct. I mean, we have put the ATM in place for, for strategic uses. You know, we had never used it before. And then, uh, you know, I am, uh, I think, obviously, a, a very strong optimist. Uh, you don't leave a great job on Wall Street where I was an investment manager for 10 years um, right. uh, and live back in a dorm uh, and, 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 and study and, and research space to start a space company unless you have a pretty strong, optimistic view and, and have the ability to have a vision for the future, Right. Um, and so uh, I, I'm certainly uh, someone who's like, you know, uh, uh, feel very, very positive about what's going on. But, you know, we have put the AGM in place because we said, you know what, um, there might be strategic opportunities for us where having a bit more flexibility on the balance sheet is going to be very, very helpful. And then, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the situation happened that because of our market cap, we were not part of the Russell 2000 anymore. And then, of course, was a was a disappointing situation. But then you ask yourself, okay, how do I how do I take advantage of the situation? How do I get something positive out of the situation? And uh, uh, the one positive for us was that we said, like, you know what, um, that is an opportunity to use the ATM effectively um, uh, and raise, you know, almost eight million dollars in a very very short period of time. Um, and that's additional flexibility that we have on the balance sheet. Um, uh, and so that's what we did. And uh, you know, with the with the investors that we have spoken uh, so far on the calls. You know, they all felt um, actually quite positive about this additional flexibility that we have on the balance sheet. Um, there is a number of companies that uh, in the current situation in the market are, you know, a little bit dicey situations. And uh, people, IP, assets, contracts are becoming available at potentially very, very depressed prices. Um, uh, and, you know, you've seen some of that happen in, in our space. And so, being able to potentially take advantage of that um, uh, as we are now puts us in a, in a strong strategic position. Um, and so that's why that's why we uh, we made that choice at that point in time. 
Now, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't see any uh, any big similar event with like a similar opportunity to do that. And so, no, I'm not uh, uh, particularly keen of uh, of selling any equity or using the ATM at this point in time. Right. Well, and it would make sense that you wouldn't be because you're a pretty big shareholder. So I am the know. largest shareholder. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> yeah, right. So your 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 money is where your mouth and actions are. Um, hundred <laughs> percent. I and I think that's important because the 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 management teams that have sold pretty much all the way out. I'm not interested in any of those companies. Um, I want to be aligned with you, and I want you aligned with me. And hundred percent. And I think shareholders all all agree on that. Now I belong to two different groups of small cap investors and we share ideas. Mm -hmm. And weirdly, I was on the phone with somebody who I hadn't talked to in a while. I used to play baseball with him and we were just throwing some names back and forth. And he goes, Hey, have you heard of this company, Spire Global? And I was like, well, as a matter of fact, I just bought a million shares. And, and he's like, really? And, And we had a talk about Spire Global. And I know that both groups um, composed of some hedge fund managers and managers at large RIAs um, are aware of Spire Global. Everybody's only concern at this point is the reverse split because everybody sees the growth, everybody sees the potential. Um, you know, and we'll talk about more of that in a second. But the reverse split has really been on people's mind because often stocks sell off after a reverse split. Now. My contention in this case, and it's rare uh, that I would have this thought, uh, usually I would agree that there will be a sell-off after the reverse split. However, I think that Spire Global, because of the growth rate and because the reverse split's been known about for a while now, I think most of that's baked in. I don't really expect you know much of a, a sell-off. You know, if, if, if there is, it lasts literally potentially hours. I mean, we'll be watching it on like a one-hour chart. Um, and I think that at some point we get some options trading on this, in which case, if you read Reddit, if you read all the stuff that's out there from all the different investing groups, and I do, I monitor all this. I I have found that in my career, I can only do so much to find fundamentals. AI can do 90% of what I did 10 years ago. I'm, I'm sure you're aware of that. So my job really has become, okay, where can I invest? What price point can I invest to really get a lot of traction as others do the same thing? Because that's what pushes the share price up. And then momentum begets momentum. And then if the stock ever gets overvalued again, now I have to think about what to do, right? So in the case of Spire Global with reverse split, one, is there a chance that we miss it? Uh, and 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 because the share price isn't that far from a buck. Uh, and I know that you can request... I, believe it's 180 more days i'm not i'm not positive you can clarify that for me but can you request another extension do you think it would be likely that you get it with the idea that share price is pretty likely to go over a buck if you do that my so opinion. um the, yeah so um uh, uh first thing i would say uh, unfortunately we cannot request an extension on the new york stock exchange okay um there might be other places where you can the New York Stock Exchange is the most variable um, uh, and, and uh, esteemed stock exchange in the world. And given what I just shared early on, like the reason for us to go public, um, the New York Stock Exchange was the best place for us to do that um, as compared to other stock exchanges, um, because it provides that um, uh, that venerability, that trust that, you know, if you talk with someone in Asia, if you talk with the government, it's like, oh, yeah, New York Stock Exchange listed. You know, I've been there. I've seen, you know, I've seen the building, yeah. right? Um, uh, so there, there is no way to to ask for an extension. Um, um, you know, in all honesty, Kirk, um, a, a lot of the institutional investors and a lot of the analysts that we spoke to um, are quite um, are quite excited that we will be doing a, a stock split uh, because they they know that a lot of investors will then become able to invest in Spire that currently are not able to invest in Spire. Right. That a lot of lists, momentum lists, value buys, and and the like that are created. And you know, I, I was a user of Bloomberg, and there's a lot of screens out there. Many of them have a criteria of you know stock price above two dollars or stock price above five dollars, something like that, right. right? So currently, we meet all of the other criteria 
right? I mean, who wouldn't want to look at a stock with a gross margin of over seven, almost 70%, a growth rate of 37% um, uh, and, and, and trading at, you know, one times ARR, right? I mean, right. That's, that's a dream for just about any stock screen to like really take a second and a third look at. What you just <laughs> said, I said to a group of about 150 people in a webinar, maybe six or eight weeks ago, it was the ARR that killed me because I don't understand how the market cap and the ARR can be about the same. <laughs> I don't, I, I, I don't either, Kirk. Um, you know, the way I look at it is like my job is to continually execute. Um, and I think there is phenomenal opportunities that uh, as we continue to execute, we create for people like yourself to back up the truck. Um, uh, and and make a a, a sizable uh, a sizable uh, profit from finding opportunities that other people overlook. Right. Um, and so we we are in the, the feedback that we have received is that there are people that are waiting for this to happen so that they can write about the stock with far more confidence. They can uh, start investing in the stock um, uh, because they are now allowed to do so. Um, uh, and that certainly would support your theory. And as you said, you know, you've been you've been right about this um, uh, for for many, many years that in this case, given the fundamentals of the company and given the opening the universe to more investors, um, uh, the stock will uh, will be well supported and continue to trade on its fundamentals and upwards um, and not necessarily downwards um, uh, from uh, from uh, from the from the reverse stock split. All right. I appreciate that. You know, the um, the retail investor who I'm most acquainted with gets scared by these things. And if mm -hmm. you're scared, you don't invest, right? And, uh, you know, going back to the investment groups I'm in, uh, I, would, I would now point over to the analyst. And the company that I made my first million on was a company called Exact Sciences. And at the <laughs> time, um, I was a little bit in front of a, a local firm on this one. Uh, and then they made it their stop top. The top stock pick of the year for small caps. So I noticed at the top of your analyst list is Robert W. Baird. And that was the company that got on board with Exact Sciences pretty early. Granted, Exact was a Wisconsin company, but you guys aren't. And for Baird to mark you as an outperform and maintain it, um, I think is a big deal. I don't know who Benchmark is, but Raymond James is very aggressive with small caps. They get in front of the street, as it were, uh, being down there in Florida, they kind of do their own thing, right? And yep. and Raymond James loves you. So if Raymond James and Baird love you, um, and Cancord annuity, I would think is probably going to reaffirm at some point. You know, and Stifle. I mean, Stifle. I mean, you've got some good analysts, not a lot of them, but some good ones who are typically early early to the party. And I watch for that. You know, when I find a company that has seventy five analysts, I'm like, well what can be inefficient here, right? Because as an investor, I'm looking for asymmetry. I want to find an inefficient system, an inefficient situation. That makes a lot of sense. That's yeah. going to become efficient, right? And yeah. And, and so I look at you guys, I'm like, well, you're not going out of business. You know, no. I, mean, I think the worst thing that could happen to you is get bought out um, for not as much as I think you should. And I guess that won't be horrible. It would be a little disappointing because I've had that happen where I think I should get a 20 bagger and I get a two bagger. Um, but I don't really see you, you doing that. So, you know, I take a look at the analysts that are on board and all that can really happen here with this trend is that more analysts come on board as you execute the story, right? As you yeah. execute the business. And that'll be good because all these analysts have crowds of investors that follow them and brokers and advisors and on and on. You know, they get thrown on Schwab, they get thrown on Fidelity uh, alerts or interactive brokers, which I use. You know, I tell you what, um, interactive brokers guys start falling in love with you, which I think has just started to happen uh, because I watched that platform pretty closely. Um, you know, those are bigger checks. Those are big checks. So yeah. I'm looking at this and, and to me, I feel like we're coming up on an inflection point. So let's talk about the business. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to talk about the coolest thing second, but I'm going to talk about the biggest thing first as far as I'm concerned. Climate change has had a dramatic impact that I don't think the person on the street quite understands yet beyond, hey, it's not raining enough or it's too hot, right? Um, I think that businesses 
are on top of it, though. You've got airlines that have noted yeah. turbulence in the air. You have yeah. communication systems that are getting disrupted. You know, yeah. you go right to shipping that's being disrupted. Um, you know, yeah. what they tra- you know, we're trying to rebuild the transmission line. I have a good friend at American Transmission. He's like, these storms pop up out of nowhere. We have to fly the helicopter somewhere else so we don't kill somebody. So yeah. your technology is one of the best ones out there for monitoring climate change and giving alerts, which I think is important, following yeah. situations, um, helping in bad situations. Can you just yeah. tell me kind of the thesis on how your technology helps with changing weather patterns, whether people want to call it climate change or not, I don't care. The weather's changing and the whole climate's changing. Let's not argue about why. How do we deal with it? Kirk, you just touched the heart of the company. Um, the, the vision that we had 12 years ago now was that the climate is changing. Let's not argue about why, but let's argue what we can do about it. And uh, the underlying impact of climate is the weather that is impact human activity. As a matter of fact, a third of the global economy, 30, 35 trillion dollars of economic activity is impacted by the weather. And it is famously unpredictable. I mean, we all have heard of the butterfly effect, right? Um, the problem with that unpredictability is, is that to tame that, you need more data. Now, 95% of the world's population lives on just 3% of the world's surface area. And it's very easy to capture data where there are people. But 3% of the world's surface area is not enough, not nearly enough to tame the chaotic behavior of weather. So you need space. Space drives something like 80% of forecast accuracy. But the traditional way of gathering this data was billion dollar satellites, which meant that we today have orders of magnitude more satellites that treat, that stream soap operas mm-hmm. than satellites that measure weather data. Spire's mission is and was and will always be to change that. We have worked hard and invented technology that allows this capturing of weather data to not be limited to just a few satellites, but to the massive number of satellites. As you mentioned, the third or fourth largest satellite constellation on the planet. We produce more um, weather data in RO than the rest of the world combined. That was our vision. Produce more data, feed it into government level prediction capabilities, which we have built, and then create those predictions, warnings, tools, decision-making um, systems to customers um, uh, that come from all walks of life in all countries of the world and help them mitigate, reduce the impact of uh, weather on their businesses and their livelihoods. That is what we are um, at the core about. Like That is one of the two massive global trends that we identified and that is driving the demand of our business. Um, and I think you're 100% correct. When, when we started talking about this you know, 10, 12 years ago, um, even then understanding that climate change is happening and weather is getting more extreme was not nearly as pervasive as it is today um, for obvious reasons. And, and I think whatever we believe is extreme weather today will be tame weather um, next year or the year thereafter. So the technology that Spire has developed in space and on the ground and in the cloud, both the analytics and the actual data, I think are going to be crucial in helping humanity tackle that generational challenge and help us adapt and mitigate the extreme impact that those weather events have more and more often to more and more people on planet Earth. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And the... <laughs> Hence, I invested. Uh, So a question about your satellites versus the imaging satellites. I don't know that most people wrap their head around that right away. Uh, But the imaging satellites, right, Planet and um, Black Sky and a few others, uh, Maxar, I think, um, do something different than what yours does, right? They're taking pictures. You're monitoring radio frequencies and, and, and doing different things. Can you explain that real quick to people so they understand the differences in the technology? Yeah, a hundred percent. So it's, 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 I'm, I'm glad that you brought this up because I, sometimes I forget 
um, to really talk about this. Um, uh, one way to think about it is, uh, uh, is we call it looking satellites, talking satellites, and listening satellites, you know, right. just as you and I are looking, listening, and talking, right? Um, looking satellites, they take the reflection of the sunlight on the surface of Earth um, and capture pictures um, if there is good weather, right? If there's a bad weather, then, you know, it, it doesn't really work, right? Um, so it works, you know, great during the day um, and is most often used over land because the ocean, even though they're the vast majority of Earth, you know, there's not a whole lot of things that they can capture there um, with their looking satellites. Then you have the talking satellites, um, which basically are satellites that, that transport information or data from one spot on Earth to another spot on Earth via space. And, you know, there you have, you know, things, everything from, from like Starlink to Viasat to ASD and, and you know, and, and OneWeb and Kuiper and a whole bunch of other companies. And then you have listening satellites, listening satellites that use radio frequencies, radio waves, RF technology to observe what is happening on Earth or around Earth. Now, RF technologies, they, they work day and night um, in all weather conditions. As a matter of fact, as we just talked about, they give you information or can give you information about the weather. Um, and so there is a, there's a lot of um, uh, differences from a technology perspective that result in, you know, the largest imaging constellation of the world, which is even larger than ours, captures um, the land mass of Earth, the 25% to 28% once a day. Um, Spire captures all of Earth 100 times a day because that's how RF works. And they work during day and night and in all weather conditions. Um, uh, so there are very, very distinct use cases. Like if you want to know deforestation in the Amazon, you know, you have to call our friends at, you know, Planet or Black Sky or Maxar because their technology is superbly um, uh, 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 trimmed to deliver this type of insight, right? Um, if you want, however, to know what is the weather going to be there, well, then, then you're going to call us, right? And if you want to know if there might be a wildfire, you know, well, then, then, you, then, you, then you're going to call, call us for, um, uh, for that type of information. So very, very different use cases um, between those three types of, uh, of companies. There is no competition. There sometimes is collaboration um, between those companies to serve a, a combined use case. Generally, that's in the in the global security space and not in the commercial realm. Um, but there is collaboration. We certainly have collaborated with um, uh, with looking satellite companies um, uh, in that case. Okay. Well, since you uh, finished on collaboration. What do you think the odds are of a little bit of consolidation in this space or at least more collaboration? Because, you know, I'm a geopolitical guy. That's what I studied long, long time ago. And it seems to me that while I'm an optimist, I am, I don't think we're going to blow up the world. Uh, I do think that there will be continued flare ups um, in the world. And I think that the the use of satellites for different purposes in different ways but coordinated or in a collaborative way is going to make a lot of sense. What do you see coming in, in that general realm? I mean, how much shared data in particular, uh, because we know what AI can do with data, and what type of customers are, are going to want that type of full service sort of approach? Because I take a look at the Fortune 500, and I got to think that they're all on the list, and most of the governments are on the list. And how, you know, do we go all the way down to the billion dollar companies that are on the list? You know, how big is that market really? Because I, th I think it's coming and I think it's coming way faster than people think. I think, you know, I happen to, to agree with you, but I mean, that's, uh, I think, substantially less relevant than this, um, this little company that some people might have heard of. I think it's called McKinsey, McKinsey <laughs> Consulting. Right. Um, uh, happens to to fully agree with you as well. I mean, they came out with a report to their, you know, I think it was Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000 um, CEOs that said, um, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't know exact quote, but it basically said, um, if you don't have a space strategy today, you need one. And they were leaning on something similar that they and others were saying in the late 80s about the internet. If you don't have an internet strategy, you need one. That back then, it was Moore's law, the doubling of compute power every two years that was driving the growth and relevance of the internet for just about everyone. Today, it is that law that, that, that I found in, in my research, the, the capabilities improving tenfold every five years 
uh, per kilogram of satellite mass um, that is driving now for two and a half decades um, uh, uh, the, the, the use cases that can be sold from space. And some of the largest challenges that humanity face, climate change, global security, food security, um, they will require space to successfully tackle. And I'm with you. I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm a 100% believer that humanity will tackle those challenges. We've seen that in just you know, recently in the global pandemic, that the you know, human ingenuity, especially if it works together, can overcome just about anything thrown at us. And so I do believe that it will overcome them. And I do believe that space will become a larger and larger and inextricable components of us overcoming that. Now, um, the, so that means that overall, we're going to use more and more space to overcome that. Um, with regards to collaboration, I do think that we're going to start to fuse more, uh, more of the data services. But the way I think of it is like a little bit more um, how the internet, you know, today we have an app about our bank on our phone. And we have an app for our, you know, a, a car service on our phone. And, you know, we maybe have an app, you know, to take pictures on our phone and then and share those pictures. So there is a shared device, but the data is not necessarily combined, um, at least not necessarily in a positive way. Some uh, advertising companies might combine them in a, in a nefarious way. So I think there will be easier and easier interfaces for um, companies to leverage space data. And I think there will be more and more companies that provide their space data in a similarly simple form as Fiatal. I mean, like our vision from day one was we want the slickness of Silicon Valley to the technology capabilities of NASA levels and above satellites, right? right. That's, that's basically what Spire provides. Like, I mean, we have customers that go from first time meeting us to having the data in their system in 48 hours, right? You know, any, anyone who has, has someone in their household that knows a little bit of Python, they will be able to visualize our data or do something with it within a matter of like a couple hours because we got scripts online that you can download that um, help you how to request our API to visualize it and work with it. So, so for us, it's like the slickness and the ease of use. And I think that will permeate more and more satellite capabilities so that using satellite data will become easier and easier. Is there going to be some master of the universe mashup where all the data comes together and is combined into some product? There are not that many where you need large number of different satellites. There are some, but I still see that as a smaller overlap area, right? So I, I still see competition um, much, much stronger inside the, you know, looking segment, the talking segment, um, the listening segment, then, uh, then I see any across and even collaboration of like the data sources across. I see more collaboration inside the segments as like different looking satellites combine different type of looking and different listening satellites combine different type of, uh, of listening than, than across the segments. But, um, I think that's a, that's a fantastic um, uh, uh, question. And, you know, we'll all be there over the next, you know, um, uh, five and 10 years and decades to see how that eventually plays out. Right. Yeah. So uh, I, I did read that McKinsey report. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, where I was really going with that, not so much M&A, but M&A is always on my radar as, as, as an investor, but just the ability to generate more revenues and business because AI, I still don't think people understand what it's doing for combining data sets and, and then analyzing it. So if your AI can talk to pick an imaging company's AI yeah. and, some, and somehow figure, figure something out because the AIs can talk to each other, which seems like they're, seems like that's happening really fast. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, with the APIs and whatnot. Uh, one of the things you mentioned was the size of the satellites, yeah, and, and that's a huge advantage for you. So you know, we've we've owned some companies where, you know, we had to talk about uh, the size of a payload on a truck, and <laughs> and I think that it it applies here, right? So if you can get a satellite that's effective into the air 
and it's smaller and less expensive, that's a pretty big competitive advantage. And it increases the the value proposition of what that satellite can bring to you, right? It, it's more asymmetric. It's a more asymmetric, right? Yeah. Uh, equation. So your satellites, a lot of them are pretty small. Um, yeah. And I know some of them you can make for just a couple hundred thousand dollars. You know, so yeah, I mean, not... some of our satellites are literally, you know, uh, uh, the size of a, of a bottle of wine. Right. Um, uh, some others are, um, uh, you know, the size of uh, of maybe a case of wine. And okay. it's the same kind of underlying disruptive force that made the PC that fits on your desk disrupt, you know, massive mainframe computer companies that don't exist today anymore because you had a, a, a rapid innovating um, uh, service architecture from the hardware perspective. And then you had a lot of software that was running on that architecture. And one of the things that I think Spire did very early on and is now a, a massive additional competitive advantage for us is not just that we can do small satellites at scale, but they are software defined. So they can do different things. They can produce different types of data simply by us um, uploading software or running the software in a different way on those assets as they are in orbit already. Right. So so let's talk about little things in space. Uh, yeah. You have a pretty cool satellite called Adler. And, yeah. and, and you just got a contract to basically find things in space that really need to get out of the way, basically. Yeah. And, and so we were what 60, 70 years into the space exploration age, right? I don't, I forget when Sputnik was yeah. in the 50 sometime. And I, I remember my grandparents talk about Sputnik all the time when I was a little yeah. kid. Um, and as we get to a, 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 a generation or maybe a generation from now, I mean, we're going to be going to Mars. We're going to go to the moon. Uh, we're yeah. going to build several space stations, What is what it looks like. Yeah. We're going to eventually mine asteroids. So, yeah. you know, I don't know how far the asteroids are away, but way before we run out of stuff <laughs> down here. So once we have space industries, you know, space is big. So we haven't really had a problem yet with things floating around where they don't belong, but we're getting there. So you've got that, that contract. Uh, and it uses Adler, I believe, correct? That is correct. That is correct, Craig. Yeah, um, it is. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the theme that you're talking about is, of course, space debris. Right. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, generally Spire has a lot of environmental um, uh, programs and customers. And so space is another environment. And so naturally, we are very keen on, on protecting that environment. And Adler is a mission that we're doing uh, with Findus and with the, uh, with the Austrian uh, Space Institute. Um, that measures um, uh, space debris, very, very small space debris that is impossible to measure from Earth, but right. can still be very damaging for um, for assets on orbit. Um, and characterizing that environment, decay times, you know, uh, how many are there is incredibly important as we leverage that environment more and more and more. Um, I do think that um, uh, space debris is a very serious issue. But I still wish that um, people would, you know, lean more, would lean less on, on gravity coming out of the movie Gravity and Sandra Bullock. Um, uh, or no, it was, uh, I think it was somewhat different than, uh, uh, than Sandra Bullock. Um, and a little bit more on gravity coming out of Sir Isaac Newton. Right. Um, you know, one way of, 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 uh, of, of sometimes giving people at least an additional image to think about is, so Spire monitors just about every, every meaningfully sized ship on the ocean. And that's about half a million ships, right? And that's just 70% of the, of the surface area of Earth. Um, we have in space right now um, something like, you know, call it, I don't know, 10,000 satellites, Right. Um, and that's just one, you know, um, a shell, so to speak, right? Because you can have, you know, satellites at 500 kilometers and then 510 and 550 and so on and so forth. So um, 10,000 satellites in space, 500,000 satellites on the ocean. Yes, there are collisions of ships, but also not that often, right? right. And in space, you can rely on the laws of physics. Um, for the movement of satellites by and large in the ocean, you sometimes you know have to resort with people and they might be less predictable. So I do think that there actually is substantially more opportunity 
for leveraging space to solve problems on Earth. But just as with like the fish in our ocean and the air that we breathe, we do have to be protective about our environment. And Spire is certainly excited to be doing its part, not just the way we operate. You know, we deorbit very, very quickly after our satellites are not used anymore, but also measuring the environment and providing the data to um, uh, to the global community um, to tackle that challenge. Right. Yeah. You you mentioned the um, the ships that you monitor. My original thesis included that I thought you could pretty much dominate the market for keeping track of shipping, which you know logistics is a big deal. And although there's a lot of talk about, um, you know, deglobalization, the reality is that there's more ships moving stuff now than there were three years ago. Um, And everybody thought that three years ago was the peak. So I don't see deglobalization the way that other people do. You know, if freight is moving, the food is moving, which I think is going to keep growing. um, You have to keep track of all these ships, right? So to me, that's still a growth industry. Uh, but it's also a, a very good foundational piece for a business that has even faster growth drivers. Um, your margins really jumped. And that's something that we look for uh, as an investor is, okay, that tells us that the spend era is coming down and that the harvest profits era is coming up. And it looks like by different metrics, you'll be profitable next year. Uh, maybe I don't know if I, I don't know if you have a shot at it for this year or not. Um, that'd be above my pay grade because it just looks close to me. Um, do you see throwing off a lot of free cash flow maybe a year or two out? Because I keep putting, you know, I still use napkins right on the back of them. Uh, I can't figure out how you aren't extremely free cash flow positive in a couple of years. Well, where, so, where can um, I be wrong there? Um, you know. If we execute what we do, you you only be wrong that you put it out in two years and not um, uh, not much much sooner than that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know we have come out very very clearly um, uh, uh, with uh, free cash flow uh, from operations uh, uh, in in Q4 being positive, and right. then uh, uh, Q1 or Q2 being adjusted EBITDA positive, Q2 being that income positive, and Q2 or Q3 being free cash flow positive after everything is said and done and paid. Right. Um, and so um, at that point in time, so as you said, very, very soon, we will be producing in a, a, you know, a, a substantial amount of free cash flow. And then we have uh, the great uh, task of allocating that cash flow in the most productive way for shareholders, which just to name uh, a few examples here is like, you know, we could be using it to invest in more sales and marketing. And, and maybe maybe have a bit of a higher growth than 37%, not that 37% is a, is a slow growth rate. Um, we right. could be uh, uh, using that cash flow to pay back debt and reduce our, our debt exposure, which is also great, right? Or we could be using that, uh, that cash to be buying back shares of Spire, right? Um, uh, which is also great. So um, uh, we will very soon be in, uh, in the position to making those choices and then reinvesting that capital in the most and best way for our shareholders, given the massive market opportunity and long-term growth that we see and have in front of us. With you being the largest shareholder. With me being the largest shareholder <laughs> so far. I, I would I would love, I would love, Kirk, for you or one of your uh one of your friends to be a larger shareholder than me. Um, that would make me very happy. That's a lot of shares. I I I, I would be surprised if uh we don't see a lot of um filings at five percent in the next year or two. Um, one of the reasons I love small cap investing is because when the institutions get on board, the float goes away, right? I mean, you can look at a lot of large cap companies out there that, you know, they have a billion shares or whatever they have, but it's 80 to 90% institutional ownership. And I think you're down at like 25% institutional ownership. So with all these institutions, um, getting ready to buy, because that certainly seems like what's been happening you know when raymond james and baird and credit swiss and can accord know who you are right that's the first step so i don't have anything really more to ask i i i i would ask do you have anything else that you want to throw out there because otherwise you know you you thank you for the hour um i know that i don't ask the same questions other people do i i would encourage everybody to go to your website because if you have any bit of nerd and you uh looking at these satellites and then reading about what they do it's just like wow 
we're we're a lot closer to uh the space age taking off again than I think people are aware of. And and, and McKinsey, you know, McKinsey is conservative conservatively saying trillion dollar total addressable market this this decade. Uh, but yeah. honestly, I, I've taken a look at your company and on all the other satellite companies and, and what Musk is trying to do, you know, and some of the other billionaires are trying to do. Um, there's no shortage of capital going into this, right? I, um, mean, there's no, the, I think you're 100%, 100% right, Kirk. There's no shortage of capital. Um, uh, and, and I do think that just as the internet um, was coming up in the late 80s and 90s, driven by this underlying, you know, Moore's Law, um, uh, and now is part of our everyday's life. I think the same thing is happening in the space industry, leveraging space to positively impacting life, driven by um, a, a 10x improvement every five year of capabilities of satellites, plus greater availability of launch, plus lower cost of launch, um, is, is something that is going to become pervasive as we, as we keep on uh, walking down this trail. Um, and, and I think, indeed, it is right that many people are not 100% aware of all of the use cases of space positively impacting Earth, and in particular, Spire use cases positively impacting Earth. So um, thanks for the, for the shout out for, for the web page. Um, I, I write on LinkedIn on a regular basis. So if, if you want to follow me there, um, you I can did. find me there, um, uh, linkedin.com uh, slash ion slash Peter Platzer. Um, uh, and, and reach out to Ben. You know, he has a, he has a regular communication with investors um, uh, uh, of, of all the use cases that are happening. And I think uh, uh, for those of you that, uh, that care about uh, planet Earth, that care about our future, um, I think it's a fascinating read of what is already possible today, let alone what is going to be possible in a few months, in a couple of quarters, in a couple of years. Thank you very much. And uh Peter Platzer with uh, Spire Global. I, I hope you make 10 times your money too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kirk. It's been a sincere pleasure. All right. Take care.